Captain's Log Supplemental. This week has been relatively uneventful. We've been finishing scans of a stellar nursery for documentation in this sector. Uh, we finally had some time to start catching up on some much needed maintenance in the meantime while the uh, science team carries out their work. I've even had time to catch up on some hobbies. Just about done with my Model Enterprise D for the case. I've grown very fond of these little ships. back everybody to another episode of captain's log supplemental uh today as always i am joined by my two friends stanford hello and rob hello so uh captain's log supplemental is a star trek rewatch podcast uh each week we're going to cover another episode of star trek we are working on star trek enterprise currently um we are going to go in chronological order so that will be fun uh just as a reminder as we are a new book podcast we always appreciate you taking the time to rate and review uh the podcast on wherever you're listening uh that does help us quite a bit those reviews go a long way in kind of helping us get the word out there about us and and frankly this week y'all are lucky that we're not just going to play Baldur's gate instead of recording a <laughs> podcast that that is very true because who yeah. oh boy that is an addicting game yeah it is <laughs> So much fun. I have um I have feedback, by the way. Oh, cool. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, so my dad's been listening. Um actually my mom listened, I think, one episode. I don't remember. This could either mom's busy. This could go in very two uh two very different directions. I'm what? sure it'll be just objectively and and you know, constructive feedback. It, it, oh, <laughs> you know what? As much as you're being snarky, dad has given me <laughs> plenty of feedback. D- dad, um, he said that he he's been enjoying the podcast and he doesn't really listen to podcasts, so like that's that's something. Um his constructive feedback is that I say fuck too much. <laughs> and, and he's not wrong although when i told my siblings that he said that they were both like that's rich <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so i just i, I either i need to uh e- e- i've got three options i can ignore his feedback i can work on it or i can just start bleeping them mm, i mean you know nobody wants to listen to beep so you know let those f-bombs fly is what i say mm. I was going to say, it'd be kind of funny if you, like, bleeped it out with some, like, Star Trek soundboard. Just drive everyone absolutely bonkers. That's the lamest thing I've ever... It'd be like, it'd be like the um, the old, like, communicator startup noise. Like, <laughs> chirp, 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 chirp. Uh, All right. Well, so this week uh, we watched Detained, episode 21. That was, it was, it was pretty, 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 pretty good, I guess. I, I actually, I like this episode. I enjoyed it. I didn't mind it. I thought it was watchable. Uh, I thought <laughs> it was just, it was like, you know what? It's funny because the, 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 the facts of my potpourri are going to be kind of a scathing indictment of this episode. Oh, good. Okay. Um, oh. But like, but like not, not, not in that way. It's just, just in general, but you'll, you'll see when we get there. But, right. um. But also, like, I don't know. Eh, I felt like the allegory was a little clumsy, and that's gonna that's gonna lose it some points for me. We'll, we'll we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um. Anyway, so the episode starts uh, a little, little little cold open wake up in the, in your you know your prison room. I guess it's not quite a cell since they're not locked in there. But uh, Archer and Mayweather, they wake up in some type of room. Mayweather first. He kind of kind of checks around. The door is open, so he kind of takes a little stroll and notices there's Sulaban on the highway. Highway? Hallway? Wow. Um, Mm -hmm. But they seem to be just going about their business. Uh, So Mayweather goes a a splore in a little bit and sees a... It looks like a little kind of like central area. There's a bunch of Sulaban kind of talking and going about their business. And so he kind of heads back to the room to kind of wake up Archer. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. We find out that someone attacked their shuttle en route to somewhere. Um, And uh, they were, I guess, were knocked out in the the attack. Um, We slowly learn that they're in some type of compound. It seems like a a prison. Um, And then eventually uh, some guards show up and tell Archer and Mayweather to follow 
uh, follow them. They get there and hey, it's Al. I don't oh, see Ziggy oh though. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. Uh, my note here says, "Oh hey, it's Al." Yeah. Yep. Man, it drove me crazy. I saw his face. I was like, "I know that guy. And Why do I know Ziggy. that guy?" He used Ziggy to 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 tell him about the shuttle pod information. Is it Ziggy if he doesn't smack it? That is my um, question to you. Hmm. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. I think uh, of important note, the guards are not Sulaban. <laughs> Yes. Fair point. No. Yes. They're... I, I have douche guard is douche. That's what I have written. Uh-huh. Yep, yeah. They're, they're definitely a different alien race. You can tell by the <laughs> very subtle nose ridge. Although mm-hmm. when, when Travis was running around and like, I, I, like I knew the episode was called detained. So I'm like, okay, they're in a prison or whatever. Right. But it is funny that like, except for that information, you can't distinguish between the prisoner common room and like a quote unquote marketplace from any other episode because their sets are always so like <laughs> cramped and seem like they're indoors. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I, I, I literally called it like a market in my notes. I'm like, they're in some kind of markets. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to lie. When, when they first open up on that cold open, I really thought that it was like that same little shed that they were being held in mm-hmm. like Archer and Paul in that one episode. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that, yeah. That did immediately come to mind. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder how many Star Trek episodes open up with like, we are not on the ship because we got captured or whatever. Cause it's gotta be, it's gotta be quite a number. There's, there's definitely a few. It's a, it's a good in media res, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least we didn't start in the cafeteria eating this time. So there's that. But, but <laughs> people do eat. So like, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually, we're at the point now where I, I need us to call out an episode where no one eats if it actually happens. <laughs> that's fair. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, anyway, so, so Al, uh, also known as, I think, Grat. Uh, uh, he's in Al in my notes through and through. <laughs> <laughs> Al Colonel is, uh, Grat. Seems very nice uh, initially. You know, he's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, this is a mistake. Uh, what were you doing in that military zone? Oh, well, honest mistake. You just have to wait three days uh, before we can ship you to the thing for the magistrate and you'll be good. It's fine. OK. Um, he doesn't even give them their phone call. No, he doesn't. He he specifically says they can't contact the ship, which is, you know, obviously the first clue that things are maybe not what they seem. Uh, you uh, know he, what? I, I will say, actually, like you, you say that, but until Al wants specific information, he's completely on the up and up. Like he does call enterprise and he's like, Hey, uh-huh. we got him for a few days. Uh-huh. Like I actually, I don't think Al was lying at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But dude, like the first time you see a bunch of like space troops and all black clothing, you know, something bad's going to happen. Right. And I think that's my point. Like they have to use those, like obvious these are evil people because until then it's like okay this all seems actually kind of reasonable yeah for sure yep i agree um you know except for the part where he says he can't you know call the enterprise and tell them what's going on um he also mentions that they should keep to themselves and not talk to the Sulaban, which is also you know another clue <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't talk to these prisoners we're abusing it's fine don't just just leave them alone um Anyway, they they go back to their, you know, room, I guess. Um, And, uh, you know, the the vittles aren't to their liking. Uh, Space slop is once again on the menu. (laughs) Um, Archer does some uh, archering when he goes uh, to get water and starts to (laughs) to lecture (laughs) lecture a prisoner. Jesus Christ, he gets he's going to get some water and like he's next in line. Sure. And then a prisoner kind of like without looking at him, kind of cuts in front of him, grabs his water and leaves. And Archer's like, Jesus, there's a lie, dickhead. It's like, (laughs) dude, he's a fucking prisoner and it cost you 20 seconds of your life. Can you (laughs) calm down? (laughs) Yep. Yeah, like, uh, all you have to do is survive for like three days. Fucking Captain Karen here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, uh, he, like I said, he starts lecturing this, uh, you know, Suleban prisoner. About, How could you do this to your children? I obviously know everything there is to know about mm-hmm. Suleban. Uh, which he's, he's quickly disabused of that notion. Um, he also ends up getting the, uh, uh, the guy he was talking to, Danik, I guess is his name. Um, yep caught after curfew and he ends up in solitary way to go dickhead archer 
So, and this is where I learned that I guess they're like horse apple skin is not part of the gene hacking. Yeah, I I was also surprised by that. Yeah, I had assumed that their skin looked like that because I, I mean, is that racist of me? I, it might be speciesist. I assumed that the alien race skin was like that because they were like genetic whack jobs, not because like their skin was just naturally gross. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, now you're speciesist. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we get back to the ship and as you mentioned, uh, Al does contact the ship and explain, uh, that they have to, they have to go, you know, pick up Archer and Mayweather once they see the magistrate in three days, Trip wants to <laughs> immediately go rescue him. Did, mm-hmm. did y'all, did y'all see the, the, the guy who replaced Travis on the bridge? Uh-huh. This like white dork is the dorkiest dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like who, who, I'm flying the ship now, dude. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, so 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 Trip uh, obviously wants to go rescue uh, the captain immediately, and it just immediately does not trust the guy. Uh, and Paul's like, now, now, I mean, you know, we broke their laws and we need to respect it and just follow, you know, it's, it's, we're in their thing. The captain would say the same thing if he were here. And I just thought to myself instantly, no, he wouldn't. No, <laughs> not even a little bit. He'd be already out the door. Like it was clearly demonstrated in the last scene that Archer does not know how to mind his own business. Yeah. Yeah, there there would be grapplers involved. <laughs> yeah, Archer couldn't mind his own business if his life depended on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so back in the uh, the the internment camp, Archer's talking to Danik now about the whole situation with with those the Sulaban there in the prison. Um, he's kind of starting to not fully, you know, he's not he's starting to distrust the the Tandarians more at this point because of kind of how they've been. Ta- Tandarians. Something like that? I, don't I think know. it's Tandarian, if I recall. I watched it today, so it's kind of fresh in my head. I also watched it today, but my head just might be wrong. Oh, did you know. did you have trouble with that made up word? <laughs> yeah, I apparently did, yeah. Um Also, th- this is the one part where the Sulubans, like he tells like a little nursery rhyme and is like, it's a terrible fucking nursery rhyme. Someone dies in the end of it, like horrifyingly. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh Danik points out that Archer's racist ass assumed he was, you know, part of the cabal initially, uh, which is true. And he, he, you know, Archer owns up to it. So that's that's nice. Um, You you know, looking back at this show from 2023 and like how uncomfortable neo-Nazis and the whole QAnon thing is these days, the word cabal kept popping out at me. And I was like, ah, God, that's uh, Jesus. I don't like that word anymore. Mm. Because like that's. That's the word used for like, you know, the, the, the supposed Jewish conspiracy and the space lasers and whatnot. Oh boy. Yeah. Cause I yeah. believe, I believe cabal is like a Jewish word, like a, either in he, I assume in Hebrew. Well, we live in some, uh, some interesting times. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're as, as then it's talking, we were, it's obviously kind of that this is definitely some type of internment camp. You definitely get the, you know, Japanese internment camp allegories here in the description, which to your previous point, if they had just left it here like that, it would have been much more impactful instead of later in the episode. Where they actually distantly say it. Say it. Yeah. This show yeah. cannot let allegory stand without calling it out like out loud. Yeah. Like, just, just let it speak for itself. It's like, like I got it. Like, I get, we I, get I, it. Cause it, this is the point in my notes where I read, Oh, so this is supposed to be like a Japanese internment yeah, allegory, yeah. I guess. Like that's exactly yep. my line in the notes. Yep. hundred percent. And we got it. You did a good job with it. Great. It was, we got it was it. all right. It was all right. I mean, they did a good job with it in that it was, it was pretty, you know, obvious what was happening. I don't it's, think I th- got the message. Sure. That's true. Um, I think that they they underplayed the amount that, like, in real history, Japanese were fully integrated into our communities and, like, overnight experienced sure. these horrible things, you know? Yeah. But, but regardless, you know, they, they got, they got to 40 go back minutes later. In, in 2002 <laughs> writing, so, yeah, you gotta right. give them a break. 
Yeah, they and still they felt the need to just just jam it right in there. Yeah, they let us know. They let us know. <laughs> so I believe at the end there earlier. was like a sign that said like <laughs> Japanese internment <laughs> allegory. Um, but yeah, so I was talking about that. You know, we 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 learned that there is no kind of Suliban homeworld at this point. It's apparently unlivable, and there's no you know Suliban central government. So that's they're just kind of fractured throughout different parts of space on different planets. Um. Which that, is, I don't think we ever knew before to this point. No, I don't think so. I guess they're trying to be like, like, like the Romani, you know, like a, di- a mm. diaspora people. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, we also learned that Denix, you know, wife is trying to transfer in and, you know, he just, she keeps getting rejected and it's terrible. So just kind of more piling on top of the, the internment camp part thing of things. Um, I think then it just goes right into a midday inspection time, which, you know, prison-y. So shortly after that, uh, Archer goes in for a second chat with Al and uh, Grat warns or Gratz. I don't know what his name. Al. Al. His name is yeah. Al. <laughs> Al warns uh, Archer off of talking to the Suliban again. He's heard he's being, you know. Which um, it just occurred to me that like maybe we're not being clear because like maybe not everyone is in their mid to late thirties. Um, Al is a character from Quantum Leap, the show that Scott Bakula was also like the the main character of um Mm -hmm. so that's that's the same actor who is playing this particular b character whose name completely escapes me he passed away like a few years ago i think he did yeah yeah Yeah. um but yes that's why we keep calling him al because that was his name in quantum leap oh but he's you know he says you know don't talk to the suliban and then he has apparently very good intel on what what the yeah. Enterprise has been up to. The more he laid it on, the more I'm like, the shuttle pod has a lot of data in it for some reason. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's weird that delay. it's got like. Well, and he said he said that there's also like he worked with like his you know Intel people or so. I don't know if it was like just right. the 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 shuttle, but he also mentions like you know my people saw you got you know shot in the leg or whatever. Or she got shot, the person on that one planet got shot in the leg. So there was also yeah, he, this this level of like, why is this random guy in charge of some internment camp have access to all these intelligence networks and shit? Very high clearance, I guess. I think he's a colonel. I mean, he is Al. <laughs> uh, anyway, Grant threatens Archer and, and Mayweather with with missing their 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 trip to the home world for his magistrate, so they can go home. Um, if he doesn't give him the, you know, information on the Suleban and Archer is basically just shut up at this point because he just doesn't like the guy. Um, it was like, I get it. He doesn't like being told what to do. But like, how when your option, is that? <laughs> yeah, but like when your options are, OK, either just give him the information that will clearly exonerate me at this point or I'm going to be stuck here for at least the next two months. Eh. But then he doesn't have a chance to be like high and mighty. Yeah, that is option A at all times for Archer. Well, no, he could have come back true. with the Enterprise. Option A is no consent. Option D- B <laughs> is be haughty as fuck about it. Uh, oh god. Uh, so after the conversation, Al blows smoke up the ass of the Enterprise crew. You know, makes some excuses about why things are delayed. Uh, the crew at this point though is able to track the signal. And makes their way to the planet or moon or whatever that has the internment camp. Which, uh, um, f- for nothing else in this episode, the internment camp looks badass. <laughs> it was like it was like uh, whoever the model or uh, was on that that particular piece of CGI did a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was good. Um, Archer, uh, you know, goes back to Manthe Waiter says, you know, or I think he's talking to Danik actually at this point. He says he won't give up info. You know, because he doesn't like being strong armed. He doesn't like what the Tandarian, Tandar, and whatever their names are doing to the uh, to the Sudalban there. We I'm look, one of you. Mm-hmm. We get just a little more backstory, and you know, say, oh, there was an escape attempt before, but it sounds like the Tandarians made up the fact that the escapees were armed and basically just murdered them. So a little bit more. Hey, these guys are evil. What? Why uh, do they keep their ships like right there? That seems like a bad strategy for a detainment. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's totally fine. You're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Danik is hesitant to try to escape, but eventually gets on board with old Captain Archer. Um, 
we have a little fun mini chat with uh, Mayweather and Sajin. <laughs> Travis here. Travis walks up to this guy who is clearly, oh, I just bumped my mic, walks up to this guy who is clearly writing something and the first words out of his mouth are, writing a letter? Like, <laughs> like, that's the way you talk to a preschooler. Like, how about a hi? Or, oh, hey, what are you doing? Or like, oh, are, you know, I, no, you know what? Just obviously he's writing. Ask him what he's writing if you're that fucking nosy. Hmm. Uh, unsurprisingly, old Sajin is not super thrilled with uh, talking to Mayweather and basically mm-hmm. tells him to fuck off. Um, he says, he says, you expect me to scurry up the wall or turn my face inside out? And I'm like, to <laughs> turn your face inside out would be pretty impressive. Like, that's how it's... <laughs> it's a good party trick. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty soon the Enterprise arrives and beams down a, a communicator to the captain. You know, they come up with a little escape plan. Um, and this is where we get in the little heavy handedness of the uh, the Japanese internment camps. They, they just... w- well, in in. Like, and there's no, absolutely no way that the enemy is going to detect their transporter signal, of course. Mm-hmm. She triaxillated the signal. So anyway, they immediately <laughs> detected the signal. Um, uh, I don't, what does triaxillating even fucking mean? Like, what, that's, what's, that's, what's, I don't even know what the word axillating means here, much less three of them. It's just random techno babble words that they come up with to make it sound fancy. I had my note as it's Archers 11 or 4. I don't know. Uh, but uh, they're coming up with their, their escape plan. And uh, Sajin is, of course, an naysayer. Danik says, fuck off. And they <laughs> they continue to play it. Al is questioning Archer again uh, after they've discovered the, you know, the the communicator that Mayweather had Mayweather gets all roughed up by the guards um we kind of jump back to the ship a little bit you know and there we get you know oh the Enterprise is planning their attack and Phlox is doing some cosmetics on somebody he's not happy with the nose though which I thought that they were going to make someone look like one of the guards yeah you know mm-hmm. the much more easily made alterations well, well, and like regardless of that like that's that that makes sense to me however like how much diddling is different about the nose does Flox have to make when the face is all one texture yep like the sulaban just look like a horse apple like that's all they look like if you got it right everywhere else why do you have to keep fucking with the nose are you trying to say that the sulaban all look the same <laughs> <laughs> I don't like I don't like it here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um anyway, uh Al contacts the Enterprise and you know tells them to back off. We got two patrol ships and they're very scary. They're there's two of them. They're gonna shoot at you. Obviously they ran out of CGI budget because we never actually well, saw those on screen. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Is this is this the first time that the Enterprise's torpedoes are actually effective? Well, I don't know. I didn't get to see it. <laughs> they definitely ran out of CGI budget for the episode after the first few pew pews from the patrol ships because they're mm. just like fire torpedoes. We hit them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, we're out of budget, so we're really going to need you to sell this. <laughs> yep. Um, although we do we do see them swooping in there to, to fire on the base after that. So I, I guess they had to save it, save the budget for that. They couldn't afford the budget for torpedoes but uh oh sajin sees uh sees malcolm or uh, malcolm uh mayweather all beat up and kind of feels bad i guess uh they put way too much wadding in travis's lip like, there's a lot like it's supposed to be like his lip is swollen but it clearly looks like he just has like a like Some a stuff in his mouth in yeah. his fucking mouth <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Also, um, Al uses their communicator to talk to Enterprise. Do they not have like unlock codes on those? Apparently you know, they're not. Like swipe your finger across some dots or whatever to get that to unlock. He just figured that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. All right. Um, to Paul invites uh, Al to dinner. Seems very gracious. You know, have some have some num nums. You know, the Enterprise likes their num nums. Vegetarian dinner. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which was, of course, just a cover for them doing some some signal jamming. Uh, um, yeah, they they did a DDoS attack against them. D- <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, in this this chaos, Mal- they beam Malcolm down as a Sulaban, um, and he brings he brings the pew pews for the uh, for the guys to use on their escape. Yeah. Pretty soon after that, uh, they kind of. It just kind of all goes. There's explosions and and firefights and we we see the entire like B team bridge crew at this point Mm -hmm. and like whoever's running tactical. Well, the tactical like read station is being run by the ship's accountant at this point because like (laughs) at this point, uh, like Danik gets caught up in a firefight. He tells everybody to go Then like they get to the the shuttles or whatever and Sajix like. Or Sajin's like, ah, no, I'll go. I'll go rescue him. It's fine. But, like, then you don't see what happens to them afterward at all. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's right. We never did cut back to them, did we? No. Like, like Sajin goes, and then the episode ends. <laughs> so, oh. yep, they escaped. Like, did they, though? <laughs> Reed uh Reed blew a hole in the wall and he was yep. like waited till the guards were right next to it. Like he's like, Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some guys with this too. This would be great. He was very excited about that. First time he's gotten to blow something up, he was super fucking stoked. <laughs> he's always excited about blowing stuff up. Oh, and apparently the shuttle pods have phasers now. Andy. Like, damn. Barely got that thing working on the main ship like three or four episodes ago, and now they're just mobile. Mm-hmm. But oh, uh, yep, the, yeah. the, epi- the episode wraps up. Archer's a little more posturing and judgy, and then they escape. The end. Uh, Reed got sucker punched by Al. That was fun. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Al yeah. kind of surprises them, and then they talk for some reason. And that gives, you know, of course, uh, Reed some time to, to wake back up and mm-hmm. tackle the, him. The Archer's about to pistol whip him, but decides not to. Mm-hmm. Al looks very scared at that point. Yeah, he does. Probably because he was like, oh, shit, I don't know if this is real acting or if Scott Bakula is about to pistol whip me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so, yep, that's the episode. Um, it uh, It ended at a point and then it was over. You know, like, I was generous enough to give it a five, but, like, I feel like I want to drop it down to a four after having talked to it with (laughs) other people. The problem is, A, like, it's a clumsy allegory, but, like... agreed. B, and this is a general complaint, especially of older Star Treks, but, like, can we get some fucking women on the screen? Like... Never. There were, like... You know, of the named cast, you only get, you know, Hoshi and T'Pol. But, like, this episode introduced, what, seven, eight named characters and none of them were women? Like, Jesus Christ, people. I mean... I don't think... I'm I'm curious now how many Star Trek episodes individually actually pass a Bechdel test. I'm assuming it's almost none. (laughs) It's probably not a lot. Well, when you have Voyager such... might have a couple because Jane Way and Torres would like go on about engineering every once in a while. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we did you know, like I don't know if it's I don't know how they determine who runs Enterprise when Archer's not on it, because it's almost always to Paul. I would have assumed that at some point Trip would take over, but it seems like to Paul always winds up. In command Trip, of the bridge. Trip was in charge during um, when T'Pol and Archer were off the bridge during the Fortunate Son thing. Yep. Oh, that's true. Because Trip's and when they got captured in Shadows of Pajem. Hmm. But anyway, I was going to say T'Pol like continues her her streak of badassery at the end yeah, of this episode. Yeah, pretty. T'Pol's pretty good in this episode. I liked her. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so my rating, I would, I, you know, I, I honestly stuttered at a six, but now that I've talked to you, I, I've dropped it down to a five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, I just gave it a five straight the whole okay. way through. <laughs> <laughs> like it was like I watched it. Was a it. good episode. As I say, I watched it and I generally enjoyed it, but the more I've, I've talked about it, I'm like, yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> I, I like that they took the chance to, you know, point out that not all of the Sulaban are just, you know, sure evil (laughs) but they are all ugly (laughs) and on that note (laughs) (laughs) we will be right back all right welcome 
Welcome back, everybody. Um, so for this deep dive, it's going to be a little bit different today. Um, wanted to discuss a subject that this episode was really kind of uh, supposed to be an allegory about, although ham-fisted the imp implementation was, um, which was the Japanese uh, in American internments of World War II. Um, this is uh, something that is is more well known now about, but uh, certainly is not really discussed a whole lot when you're <laughs> growing up and learning about um, American history. I don't know how much you guys got on it when you were growing up, but I think I had about uh, one day where they talked about it a little bit, and then they moved on quite quickly. So I had a oh, no we uh, oh go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we had like a whole section of class about it. Well, it, it was really about World War II and that time era. It, it was kind of interesting. They did a crossover between our social studies classes and our English classes. So we wound up reading a couple of books, watching a couple of movies, and writing a whole bunch of reports on Ow. it. Um, one of the things we specifically read, it was, I can't remember the name of the book. I, I was trying to look it up before this. I couldn't find it. Um, it was the account of like a young girl who grew up inside mm -hmm. of one of the internment camps. And she was complaining about the mango rice because it's just not what rice is for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, I read too. that book too. Book yeah, yeah. I have no idea. I was also trying to find it, but could not. Um, yes. I, um, like Rob also had a small unit on, uh, this particular thing and actually specifically read that, that particular book, which is like a, uh, I, I must've been in, I think I was in, uh, Virginia still. So I must've been like seventh or eighth grade, like middle school era. Mm. It was eighth grade for us. That's about when I remember it being covered, but I definitely did not have like a whole unit on it. Yeah, mm. we did a we did a whole book um, where we talked about you know we we did that book in English class and then in social studies we talked about uh, you know some of the some of the the shitty ramifications of it. Sure. Yeah. Well, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, after the uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II, uh, America uh, decided that we should basically in turn any uh any japanese born americans um for as as this episode also mentioned for their own protection was the the selling line at the time of course Jesus. Um, really what it was was of course uh paranoia about possible spying and you know other sentiments that might go from that population what, what, go ahead was it paranoia? I was under the impression that it was like, like thinly veiled, like racist bullshit, you know, like not like there was no actual serious considerations about like spying. It was just an excuse to, you know, seize their shit and kick them out of our cities. Yeah, I think that's a large part of it as well. But I I don't <clears throat> for what I have read, okay. it is not 100 percent that it was definitely, you know at least used as another excuse to do it. Sure. Um, so of the, the 127,000 Japanese Americans who were living in the continental United States at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, about 112,000 of them were on the West coast. Uh, and 80,000 of those were, were second generation Japanese Americans. So, you know, their, their parents were moved, immigrated here and they were born in America. Uh, uh, also third third generation so these were not these were not you know non-citizens these right. were, were you know right. american citizens that had right been they weren't the country. they weren't immigrants they were straight up american citizens just yes. like you and i right mm -hmm, exactly um God. they were they were placed in concentration camps based on basically local population co concentrations and various the various regional politics there was um a lot of camps in California, but also in Arkansas, apparently, which is where George Decay uh, and his family were spent a, a, a large portion of their time in the internment camps. Um, apparently, in Hawaii, um, there are more than which has a large Japanese American population. There's more than 150,000 of them, um, which is one third of the territory's population at the time. Uh, only about 1,200 to 1,800 were incarcerated. Um, California defined anyone with, uh, with one sixteenth or more Japanese lineage as a person who should be incarcerated. Uh, while the architect of the program, Carl Benditson, uh, basically said, and here comes your, your racism, uh, one drop of Japanese blood qualified for incarceration. Jesus Christ. Good God. 
Yeah. So wait, was I thought this was done at a federal level. Was it done at a state level? Or was it a mix? Uh, I think it was a mix. Yeah, I believe it was one of those things where, like, the federal government said do this, but the states were given so, prerogative. Yeah, Roosevelt authorized Executive Order 9066, okay. which was issued two months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the order allowed regional military commanders to designate military areas from which any or all persons may be excluded. Although the executive order did not mention Japanese Americans, this authority was used to declare that all people of Japanese ancestry were required to leave Alaska and the military exclusion zones from all of California and parts of Oregon, Washington, and Arizona, with apparently the exception of those inmates who were being held in government camps. Like, I feel like it's pretty telling that Hawaii, one of the like largest overall relative demographics of Japanese people in the United States, opted to not do it. Whereas, yeah. like, parts of the continental U.S. did. Like, that's... Uh. I will note that also the, deta the detainees were uh, not only people of Japanese ancestry, they also included a relatively small number, uh, though uh, somewhat over 10,000 of people of German and Italian ancestry as well. Um, I did manage to find that book, Rob. It is called Farewell to Manzanar. Uh, that's it, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a memoir, so it is not just... I was I was vaguely worried, like, oh no, two white guys read it. Like, I was afraid that, like, <laughs> it was it was like some white savior nonsense or whatever. Right. I, think my, I think my dryer just finished up. Um, but uh, it is actually a memoir um, of... Uh, so it is, is at least dictated, if not written, by the woman herself. Hmm. So, uh, later on... Um, there were, uh, under pressure from um, various Japanese-American um, organizations, uh, Jimmy Carter opened an investigation to determine whether uh, the decision to put Japanese-Americans into concentration camps had been justified by the government. Uh, guess what? It wasn't. Yeah. Um, in we 1983, yeah, the, in 1983, uh, the commission's report found little evidence of Japanese disloyalty at the time and concluded that the incarceration had been the product of racism. Ba -da -ba. <laughs> and it recommended that the government pay reparations to the detainees, uh, which they did. In 1988, Ronald Reagan signed into law the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which officially apologized for the incarceration on behalf of the U.S. government and authorized the payment of $20,000, uh, equivalent to about $49,000 in today today's money uh to each former detainee who was still alive when the act was passed uh the legislation admitted that government actions were based on race prejudice war hysteria and a failure of political leadership um which i'm sure ronald reagan was was pleased to throw in there as well um mm. By 1992, the U.S. government eventually dispersed more than about $1.6 billion uh, in reparations to 82,219 Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated. So that's a little bit of history. And I did want to touch on um, somebody who, of course, is um, beloved in the Star Trek universe, George Takei. I had mentioned him earlier. Uh, he was uh, lived uh, in one of these internment camps when he was very young. Um, he was at five taken from his home. Um, with his family, which he said, uh, sorry, I'm trying to look for the quote here. Basically, you know, it, uh, they, uh, they, po they pointed bayonets at all of us and told us to leave on the morning of December 7th. Well, no, sorry. Uh, it was two weeks after, I guess, or the two months after, um, the Pearl Harbor when the, the, the order was signed in and basically the military uh, showed up at his home and ordered everybody to leave at, uh, at gunpoint, more or less, which is just incredibly sad and terrible for a five-year-old or anybody for that matter to go through. Yeah. I can't imagine being that young and having to like stare down a bayonet. Yeah. They stopped. It, it, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say like he, he has a book too, actually. And, um, it is, yeah, a memoir. K, yeah. it is a memoir it is, of his book, of, yes. of, of that incident, is They yes, Called Us Enemy. They Called Us Enemy, yep. It was co-written um, by, I'm trying to find the names here. Justin Isinger, Stephen yes. Scott, and Harmony Becker. Uh, Harmony Becker was the illustrator of the uh, of the graphic novel. Um, but uh, he, he kind of details in that kind of his experiences with it and how he didn't as a five-year-old of course didn't really understand everything that was going on right 
And like, he, um, and, and, and to be very, very clear, like these are not, again, these are not like Japanese citizens who were living in America and right. we had to like contain it. Like George Takei is in America. He was born in California. I believe. Yes. These are, are you know, many like, second and third generation and Japanese Americans. They have their, they and their family have been in. American citizens for a long time. Right. And I don't know, you know, obviously we're not, you know, behind the bastard. So we're not going to go like real, real deep here. But like afterwards, they had lost so much like accumulated wealth and generational yes. possessions because like when they were gone, the white people in their neighborhoods just took their shit. Yeah, he, uh, uh, George K mentioned that his father, uh, basically had to sell everything for basically almost nothing mm -hmm. when they were forced to leave. So, it, and they by were the lucky time enough left, to get anything. Right. By the time they left the camps, they were destitute. Uh, they, uh, they had to, you know, they said, he said their parents, after they had left the camps, uh, basically worked their fingers to the bone and eventually did kind of get back on their feet, which I'm sure was not the common outcome for most of them. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Ended up buying a small business, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just, as I oh, understand, sorry, it, we did this sucks yeah, for you. As I understand, like there are entire neighborhoods that just never, that never became Recovered. Japanese again. Like they just, yeah. they just, they just never moved back because other people just moved in and took their houses and their businesses and stuff. And that was it. They were done, you know? Yep. So Can you imagine fucking awful? Like we're, we're all in our late thirties. I, I could not imagine having to restart my entire life at this point. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, he, in the book, he, he, well, I think what a, a good quote was, uh, shame is a cruel thing. Uh, it should rest on the perpetrators, but they don't carry it the way that the victims do. While it is certainly a shameful thing for us to look back on and say, our country did this. Um, you know, this is, this is definitely one of those things that is, is, you know, generational trauma um he yeah. he goes on to talk about how most of the adults from that time you know didn't really want to talk about what happened a whole lot like most like a lot of people you know who experience trauma like that they don't really like to talk about it a whole lot so um he he reflects uh that after uh they left the camps he still had to deal with with uh, with racism um he said he had to deal with a racist teacher uh shortly after that and he you know he's about seven by that time and he kind of understood that it was kind of like jail that we were in but he had no idea he couldn't fully grasp what he had what they had been done to be sent there um no i mean jesus at five seven years old, it's younger than our kids like that's ugh, god yeah. i can't imagine i can't imagine what a five-year-old's thought process is as they are forced to live in this fucking awful, awful circumstance. Yeah. Like the I mean, worst part. Go ahead. I was going to say like the worst part too, is you have to go back to your life once you're out and deal with, you know, six years of ruthless propaganda against the Japanese. Mm hmm. And then, like, fight an uphill battle to, like, reclaim your dignity after that. Yeah. Yeah, I read a book in um, college, which, like, because there's a, there was a, there was a longstanding premise that, like, the, you know, part of the reason that the, the World War II was so vicious between the Japanese and the Americans was because, like, there were, like, irreconcilable cultural differences. And this book is, like... No, 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 there, 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 there weren't. It was just fucking racism. Like it was just people using the war as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Dehumanization. Be, yes, exactly. Yeah. And not just of the enemy, but also of like, you know, people who are here in the States. Who look here. like the enemy. And, and it's one of those things too, where like, it's obvious, it's obvious what happened because we were fighting just as brutally against the Germans, mm -hmm. yeah. but there were, you know, and there were German POW camps, but there was never this kind of genetic roundup of anyone right. who was second or third generation German well, and putting them I was in the camps. Say, those with German and, and Italian ancestry, I mean, much, much larger portions of the population. Absolutely. Absolutely. We would have to cordon off pretty much all of fucking Pennsylvania. 
And while well, some of them were were put in, in camps, not not nearly the same amount with a and, percentage or total amount. Right. And those camps were much nicer as well, um, as um, I understand it, because they were in like uh, they were in the Midwest um, and, and they were like they were basically like farms and they were they were treated as like. You know, I, detainment always sucks, no matter what. Like, I don't want to sound like there were German uh, citizens who were not treated shitty, but like it was distinctly different. You know, there was no, two yeah, different he, kinds of camps. Uh, Takei in his book uh, talks about how uh, at first, before he got to the camp in Arkansas, uh, they were uh, they were put in a uh, a barn in a horse stall, and their their family was was living in a horse stall. Jesus Christ. So, yeah, just and then and then yeah. After the war, these American citizens were treated like ass, mm -hmm. while you know actual Nazis were were shuffled into the government. Yeah, well, you know, we needed uh, we need scientists for the rocket program. I mean, come on. Oh, well, they just you know moved to Argentina. Well, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think that covers all my points I was going to talk about. Feel free to cut this out during editing. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have like a bunch of pages up and I've kind of been skipping around, so. Yeah, no problem. Um, this real was quick. in, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Oh, I was just going to say real quick, like, this makes me feel even happier that George Takei had all the opportunities he had later on mm -hmm. in his life. Right, he got lucky. Well, one yeah. thing uh, that I thought was interesting uh, was uh, that despite what happened, uh, his father was also very um, impactful in getting him to uh, uh, participate in democracy, and he was a big believer in democracy. So he um, encouraged him to you know, get involved in, in student government, initially in school, and be active um, in in various uh, aspects of that. And of course, later on, he's become active in, in LGBTQ mm -hmm. um, advocacy. So uh, I think it's, it's definitely interesting. It speaks to, to his father's character that he was still despite this. Um, yeah. I don't, um, I don't know if either of you two follow him on Twitter or any of his other social media, but George Takei is like a fascinating follow. Like he's, He's very uplifting of people mm -hmm. who need it. He's he's very he's a very strong positive force in the world. Yeah, well, I think that will wrap up our deep dive segment. Um, when we go get back, uh, I believe uh, Stanford has some potpourri for us. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Rob, did you say you weren't ready? No, I said also good. Sorry. Oh, okay, good. No, that's fine. We'll just keep that in. That was good. It's just good banter. Um, so uh, <laughs> after that rather heavy uh, deep dive, um, that actually segues us interestingly into a discussion I want to have about kind of the future of this particular podcast. This episode of Star Trek Enterprise was so nothing that like, I didn't really have anything interesting to kind of point out. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about, you know, with the three of us as a little discussion, the kinds of things we would like to do with this podcast moving forward, especially as we're getting very close to the end of season one. Um, and, uh, soon we'll be kicking off into season two. Um, I like Chris, um, that during that deep dive, um, you gave, uh, I don't know if there's a better term for it, but it's almost like an essay, you know? Mm, yeah. And I don't, I, I, I like, I like that format. I, I, you know, there are podcasts I listen to that are like, uh, entirely in that format. So I think that, um, you know, having you now broached that kind of concept inside this podcast i think that that might be a nice thing to sprinkle in every once in a while as well absolutely yeah 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 it's nice talking about star trek social commentary oh i meant the um the format of the essay itself but yes that too um but like if you just want to go on if you just want to write an essay about how much you love i don't know the Romulan ale and the way it's been used throughout Star Trek. Like that's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, How about yamak sauce? How do you feel about yamak sauce? What's yamak sauce? I don't know that one. <laughs> it's like some Kardashian. There's a, there was a whole episode where it, it featured heavily in DS9. Uh, you know what I realized keeps coming back time and time again in Strange New Worlds? Blood wine. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that the Klingons. Klingons has, yep. That has history in many, many Star Trek yeah, series. If yeah. you're going to talk about the Klingons, it's Gach and blood wines, and then yeah, occasionally Gach, Gach and blood wine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually, we haven't watched the last uh, Strange New World yet. Um, maybe we'll do that tomorrow night after family dinner. Um, so another thing I keep talking about with y'all, and um, I don't know if we've ever had like a real solid discussion on how that would work, is I would like to start incorporating some kind of guests into the program. Yeah. And, I, and, and that makes it sound fancier than it yeah. is. Like, it's not like I'm going to get Jonathan <laughs> Frakes on the horn and like get him on here. But well, I thought you were a close personal friend. Yeah, believe it or not. No. Um, Riker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people that are in our lives, um, people that we are one or two degrees separated from, this stuff is not impossible. Um, turns out my mom. Whoa, who is. Oh, so do you remember the main antagonist woman Klingon from the first season of Discovery? Like Empress? Yeah. Yes. Apparently my mom knows that actor like in real life and they do stuff together like semi-regularly. Crazy. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So I have, I have weird connections to stuff, but anyways, um, in my brain, the way that format would work too, would be like the guest would replace one of us for the episode that week. Um, and because I I don't want to have too many voices on at once because I think that that gets confusing. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's something I was thinking about and then, and kind of punting around. I know my dad wants to come on. Um, yeah, I think if, if none of us wants to sit out, you know, like say we do get Jonathan Frakes and nobody wants to miss Jonathan Frakes. Maybe we just have like one designated interviewer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. If we're doing like an interview with the person. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was thinking guest two could just be like a guest host kind of dealio. Um, for example, my stepfather would be an incredible guest on any kind of like legal episode because he was a lawyer <laughs> for a long time. So when we get to that, like strange new worlds where we talk about the, uh, the genetic engineering lawsuit or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, you have measure great. of man and in, in next generation. So mm-hmm. that too. I'm yeah, I wonder, sure. I wonder what his thoughts are on AI. Ooh, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a legal drama episode of enterprise. Cause there's been one every, every series, right? Everyone's racking their brains. <laughs> in, in which one? In the one we're watching enterprise. Um, it's the only one I can't think because I can think of the one from TOS that had Captain Pike. Yeah, um, yeah. But, in the there was one in there's one in DS9 where O'Brien was captured by the Cardassians and put on mm-hmm. trial. Yeah, there were a few. There were a couple in Voyager. There were a few in TNG. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first episode is is kind yeah. of that at least. All of Although, the Q episodes. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's either it's either that or they're they're Merry Men. So one of the two. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, you know, the, the, he would be a good guest for that kind of thing, too. Um, and part of me wants to start thinking about maybe looking at like a Patreon kind of dealio. Um, I think it's too early to start one now. I don't want to be one of those podcasts that's like, you know, got three listeners and they just bilk <laughs> them for everything that they're worth. Yeah. <laughs> We'll have to come up with some good rewards first. Make I, it think worthwhile. That, I think that one reward I could reliably give is like, I, I would let people watch the episode with me every week. Cause like I have to be on my computer watching it anyways. Right. Mm. Oh yeah. Community watch along. And I don't have like fun. a day job. <laughs> 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 At least one that I have to report to somebody for. Um, so yeah, that was an idea I had. Um, you know, maybe a, maybe like a, let people listen to this the way that Mariah does, mm. but they wouldn't be able to, to interject with their excellent uh, commentary the way my wife does because she's lovely <laughs> and I love her. <laughs> oh man. It would be really funny having a whole bunch of people in here just muted. And then in a text channel, they're just furiously correcting us in live time. Oh my oh, God. Yeah. I wouldn't look at that text channel even once. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. 
Um, but certainly having like a discord community would be, would be possible. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, that could be fun. Uh, just, just to have an entire channel for fucking memes, meme, like Star Trek memes, not memes about fucking, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap there, but that's not okay. what it has Well, you know, <laughs> I can't count the number of, uh, uh Garrick and Bashir innuendo memes mm, that are out there. There are quite a few. Yes. <laughs> Just that one Beverly Crusher episode of TNG over and over again. <laughs> so those were some of the thoughts I had. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on, you know, kind of like what we want to do with this show. I don't, I'm not worried that we're going to run out of material, even though Mariah is. Um, but, <laughs> but, I, I'm more worried about running out of potperies than I am deep dives. <laughs> oh, psh, no, potperies are easy. Yeah, I'm literally doing want. one right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if y'all had any ideas for things you would like to do with the podcast moving forward. Um, mm. More trivia games that belittle us and make us feel like children. My da- my dad supply. was like, "Y'all should do trivia every week." I don't know what the fuck's wrong with you. <laughs> like <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Trivia is fun, man. People, especially, especially, um, fan groups like that of Star Trek, uh, I think in particular. Oh uh, man, that could enjoy be trivia. That could be a good, um, that could be a good Patreon reward. They get to submit trivia questions. Mm. Oh, and then we can make fools of ourselves answering them. Yes. yes. Yeah. We'll let Mariah like vet them or whatever. Cause she's basically our <laughs> producer now. <laughs> but, eh, I like it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other things we could do uh, with the podcast, but I mean, definitely, I think uh, expanding to tell a little bit different formats uh, for our various segments um, would be good. I think we we're pretty varied in our potpourri already, but um, expanding our deep dives, um, I think, is a, is a good idea for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We've also talked about having like recurring segments where like we ask an expert about something and that person comes back. Yeah, I really like that idea actually. For our for a quick a quick bout of something. We'll have to find somebody who knows like astrophysics so we can ask them space questions. Oh mm. shit, I wonder if Teresa's still out there. That's true. We uh, I can't yeah. tell I they, I've we definitely had it on numerous occasions already where we debate whether or not something can happen in space. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> it's just like I don't know how gas giants work. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I was thinking that um, when we finally start getting to movies, that we could definitely format those as like watch alongs where like yeah. we're watching the movie and talking about it while it's playing so they can like MST, MST key. Well, blah, we blah, can, blah. yeah, absolutely. We can, we can rip the hell out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be fun. Um, and those would just go out on the feed. This wouldn't be like, those wouldn't be like crazy. You no, yeah, I think that's actually like that idea for the movies because they are longer. Um, I right. think Am it I, would make worse. Yeah, and I think that like it would be tough to like summarize the movies the way we do for the episodes. Right. Yeah, well, nobody wants to listen to us talk about what happens in the movie for, for an hour. <laughs> they no. save the whales. <laughs> Anyways, that is some of the ideas that I have had, that we have had, uh, as we kind of look towards winding down for the season and then starting up in season two. Um, so hopefully we will, we will take some of the best ideas out of that and, uh, and roll with them. Oh yeah. Oh, Hey, you know, whenever, uh, that, that Star Trek games c- comes out, that could be a Patreon thing, you know, play around with us or whatever. Oh yeah. That would be Oh fun. man. Cause you know how much I thoroughly enjoy playing multiplayer games with people. I don't know. Yeah, oh least... boy. It's my favorite activity. <laughs> So right. you get That's so why it's two, behind the paywall. There's two tiers. There's the there's the tier where you get to play with me, and then there's the higher tier where you get to listen to me bitch about the people I play <laughs> with. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's like I don't know who fucking Riker Fucker 69 is, but he is taking entirely <laughs> too long for his turn. Oh gosh. All right. All right. Well, that'll do us for this week. Um, we will definitely be back next week. Uh, and I think I'm summarizing next week, so I better, I better pay attention. 
Thanks again for listening to us. As we ask, uh, please do um, rate and review us on Apple, Spotify, Podcast Act, whatever you're listening to it on. Um, tell your friends. Tell people you know to come listen to us. Uh, we are we are genuinely uh, interested in getting this podcast into some more ears. Um, and, uh, you know, we enjoy doing it, and so we would like to keep doing it. And, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, it would be nice to have more and more listeners to, uh, to do that. That's all I've got, and uh, we will see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. You can follow us on Twitter at PodCLS or send us hate mail at PodCLS3 at gmail.com.